everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ethan Olson. I'm the director of Native Landscapes here at Keep Indianapolis Beautiful. Uh, I just want to start by saying it's really cool to be able to speak to such a large audience um, with such a wide variety of people. So thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, this presentation will take about 30 minutes. Um, and I'll have, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, and I'm going to warn you that I'm going to be asking you guys some questions throughout the presentation. Keep you on your toes. So um, I'll, we'll be able to ask a few questions as we go along, but uh, we'll try and move things as quickly as possible. Uh, so today we're going to be uh, learning about uh, the importance of native plants within uh, ecosystems. Uh, so to begin, what is an ecosystem? Um, an ecosystem is a biological community of uh, interacting organisms uh, consisting of both non-living and living parts um, and the physical environment. So it's a complex system, it's highly connected, highly interconnected, um, and it can be any size. So this little picture I have here is a little centipede on some moss that's growing on some rocks. That can be considered an ecosystem. Uh, planet Earth. Oh, sorry. Uh, planet Earth as a whole could be considered an ecosystem. Um, you could even consider the entire galaxy an ecosystem. Uh, but for you know, the purposes of science and the purposes of our conversations in this room and beyond, uh, we typically look at ecosystems within you know, a certain unit, whether it be a forest, uh, even your backyard, um, you know, a particular habitat or ecoregion. So, I like, uh, tend to liken an ecosystem to a computer chip. Um, you know, especially with all of us carrying around computer chips in our pockets, it's kind of a good example. Uh, you know, these uh, microchips within our phones, these microprocessors that are made up of tons of different components. Uh, some of them inhibit other functions. Uh, some of them are, you know, working together to create a certain output or a certain function. So I like to think about ecosystems as little microprocessors like this. Um, so something to remember is ecosystems are very dynamic systems. Uh, they are not just constantly stable. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can influence an ecosystem. Uh, there are internal factors, so like predation between organisms, one you know animal eating another animal, one you know insect eating another insect. Uh, there's competition between different organisms, whether it be two plants competing for sunlight. Uh, you know, decomposition, you know, a log that's decomposing can be its own ecosystem, but as that log degrades more and more over time, uh, it can essentially leave, leave the system or take on a new form um, in succession. So, you know, an ecosystem can progress over time and change over time. Uh, some of the external factors, time itself can change how an ecosystem functions. Uh, you know, the parent material, so whatever the ecosystem is grown upon, whether it be rock or sand, soil, uh, you know, water, topography. So you know a slope is going to have a different sort of characteristic than a flat land. Um, and then human influence, and this is probably the greatest external factor that will uh, alter an ecosystem's function. So climate change is a big one. Uh, humans are really good at bringing in new plants and new animals from other countries. Uh, those can drastically alter how an ecosystem can function. So, there are a lot of things that can influence the characteristics of an ecosystem and thus its function. So, why does this matter? What do ecosystems do? Uh, for us, for humans, and for the world in general, uh, they perform ecosystem services. Does anyone know what an ecosystem service is? Cleaning the air. Cleaning the air, yes, that is an example of an ecosystem service. Yes, very good. So, a more uh, specific definition, uh, this is something you might find in a dictionary or online. Uh, an ecosystem service, uh, ecosystem services are the benefits uh, that humans gain from properly functioning ecosystems. So, you know, these aren't just benefits that are only uh, gained by humans, but they are benefits gained by um, the world at large. Uh, of course, us selfish human beings like to think about our own species, so we kind of look at it through our own little lens like that. Uh, so there are sort of four main categories of ecosystem services. 
supporting services, uh, these include things like the formation of soil, so we can grow plants and grow crops. Nutrient cycling, so the plants that are grown, the crops that are grown, they're healthy. You know, habitat for animals, habitat for humans, etc. Uh, provisioning services, oops, sorry about that. Provisioning services, uh, you know, provisions, food, uh, for us raw material like wood, uh, paper, you know, things like that. Um, ornamental resources, uh, the clothing, a lot of us are wearing clothing that is made of plant material, cotton. Uh, regulating services include some of the stuff that you guys were mentioning in terms of pollution control, uh, carbon sequestration is a big one. Um, and then cultural services in the final category. Uh, this includes things like recreation, um, education, and you know, sort of spiritual spirituality. You know, nature has a certain spiritual element to it. So this is a nice little chart that sort of divides those four categories. Um, it's important for us to all realize that uh, a lot of these ecosystem services overlap between categories. Um, you know, one ecosystem service can perform functions in more than one category. Uh, so a 1997 study estimated the average annual value of the world's ecosystem services. Anybody have any idea what that figure might be? Any guesses? Uh, 100 million. Did I hear 100 million? Yes. Yeah. 100 million. Anything else? A billion? Trillion? 33? 33 dollars? 33 trillion dollars. So, this was in 1997. Um, we hope that this value is likely grown over time. Um, but, you know, the, the more that we degrade our ecosystems, um, you know, this value might shrink. Um, it's important to realize that you can't always put a monetary value on ecosystem services uh, because without ecosystem services, we would all be dead. So uh, they're sort of valueless or invaluable, I should say. So um, how are we going to build an ecosystem? Where, where do we start? Plants. So let's start. What is a plant? Um, you know, a plant is a living organism like a, a tree, shrub, grass moss, a form, um, that is able to create its own energy through photosynthesis. Uh, so photosynthesis is a, a sort of a process that plants use to turn sunlight into sugar, into actual organic energy. Um, sort of the byproducts of this, uh, these are plants, are things that all plants are able to provide. Um, air filtration, carbon sequestration, uh, pollution control, uh, water retention, heat island control, all this good stuff. Any plant is able to provide uh, these sort of byproducts of photosynthesis. Uh, landscaping beauty, that's a big one. But uh, there's an even more important one, uh, food for other organisms. So plants provide food for other organisms. However, not all plants are able to provide this service within an ecosystem. So this is an example of food web. We've probably all seen this in school. Um, if we look down at the bottom here, we've got uh, our plants, native plants. Um, plants are the producers. Uh, they, they form the foundation of the ecosystem. Um, you know, they produce energy within the system. All of the other layers, all the other trophic levels within the system are consumers. All the other organisms within the food web rely on the energy that is being produced by plants. So they need, the consumers need to either consume other organisms or other organic material in order to survive. So, uh, you know, let's look at native plants. Why native plants? Why are these important? Uh, what is a native plant? Um, so the common definition of a native plant is uh, any plant that occurred naturally in a given area or ecoregion before human interference. Here in the United States, we kind of look at that as any plant that was growing here in the United States before the European settlers crossed the Atlantic Ocean and colonized the U.S. Does that make sense to you guys? Uh, it's really important that whenever you're talking about uh, a plant being native, that you have what is called a geographic qualifier. So, for example, uh, let's see here, um, a plant that is native to California might not necessarily be native to Indiana. However, it would be considered native to the United States. 
Does that make sense? So something native in Indiana might not be native to another state in the, in the U.S. Uh, just for a little fun fact here, anybody know what this plant is here? False. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anybody know any other fun names for this? Yes. What? 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 Sorry. Can't hear me. The Indiana banana. <laughs> okay. So, uh, one fact about the pawpaw. The um, pawpaw tree, native to the U.S., is the largest fruiting tree, or it produces the largest fruit out of any tree native to the United States. So, this is uh, its native range here in the U.S. Um, I don't know if you guys have eaten them before, but there's some people like them. It's kind of a cross between a mango and a banana. So, why are native plants important? Uh, it's the relationship with our native insects. So this is, I need you guys to really focus in on this one. This is a really important slide. So, 90% of insect herbivores are specialists. Does anyone know what a specialist is? So a specialist is an organism that can only obtain its life needs from a very narrow spectrum of sources. So this isn't necessarily just food. A lot of, a lot of insects, a lot of organisms are specialists on where they live, you know, how they make their nesting material, all that good stuff. For the purpose of this dialogue, we're going to be talking about their diets, though. So, a lot of, or 90% of insect herbivores are specialists in that they can only obtain their food from a very narrow spectrum of sources. So specialists have a very deep chemical bond with the plants that feed them. Non-native plants do not provide this deep chemical bond with these insects. So what does this mean? Plants not native to an ecoregion are not going to serve as viable food sources for the wildlife within that ecoregion. Again, 90% of the insects on Earth are specialists, or 90% of the insect herbivores are specialists. So, we can start putting this together a little bit. Here's our food web. Let's take away native plants. Uh, we're going to start losing our insect specialists, the specialists that are re that require those native plants to sustain them. Once we start losing our insect specialists, it's kind of a domino effect, and we begin losing all the other organisms that feed on those specialists. To the point where we're losing pretty much everything. Nothing left. <laughs> so. Native plants are really form the foundation of our ecosystems. Uh, these are some examples of uh, what is called a faunal association. Uh, a faunal association is an association between, or a relationship between an animal and a plant. So, you guys might have seen a black swallowtail butterfly before. Uh, the larva of the black swallowtail are obligated to feed only on uh, plant species within the carrot family. They cannot lay their eggs on any other plant species. Same with Peck Skipper, another specialist. They can only lay their eggs on rice cut grass or little blue stem because these are the only plants that are able to feed the larva of these insects. Another example, uh, Pearl Crescent, beautiful butterfly. Uh, these guys can only lay their eggs on plants within the aster family. And probably the most notorious one, I know it's a small picture, especially for those in the back, the monarch butterfly. Um, I know it's written up there, but does anybody know the host plant for the monarch butterfly? Yeah. And it's within the Scepheus genus. So we'll talk about the monarch because it's a very interesting organism. Um, the monarch has one of the largest or longest migration uh, flights out of any insect in the world. Um, it actually is able, or it flies all the way from Canada down to Mexico to spend its winter, uh, and then in the spring it flies back up. So right now, if you guys are seeing any monarchs, I saw a couple today. They're actually on their northward migration. Uh, once about late August, early September hits, they'll start flying back down to Mexico. 
uh, the monarch species, uh, butterfly, uh, is actually endangered, or it's not listed as endangered yet, uh, but its populations have been declining severely. Um, what's interesting about insects is they're very their populations are very difficult to monitor. Um, you know, they're very small, they're very difficult to capture, they fly all over the place. So with the monarch, they actually measure their populations by examining their overwintering site in Mexico. So this chart here is showing in hectares the amount of sort of tree coverage that the monarchs uh, are, are covering within Mexico. So I don't know if you guys have seen pictures before, but at the overwintering sites in Mexico, monarchs literally cover the trees. They paint the trees from top to bottom. Um, it's a remarkable sight. So scientists have been looking at sort of how many trees within an area that the monarchs are covering. Uh, this chart shows us within the last 20 years, the population of the monarch butterfly has declined by 80%. Uh, this isn't a unique situation. Uh, there are 82 different species of Lepidoptera that are endangered here in the United States. Uh, the monarch butterfly is not yet on the endangered species list. Next July, they're going to decide if they do want to add. Uh, but you know, these numbers basically show that the, the population of monarchs are in severe threat. So, why is this important? As we look at our food web, uh, you know, insects support the rest of the consumers within the ecosystem. So, um, I'm going to talk about some research by uh, Douglas Talby. He's an entomologist from the state of Maryland. An entomologist is someone who studies insects. Has anyone seen this bird before? Carolina chickadee? A few of us. Has a really cool call. Just chickadee dee dee dee. You might hear that sometime. So this bird is about maybe the size of my fist or a little smaller. Um, how many eggs do you guys think that this bird lays in its nest? One? Four? Three to four. So this little mama here, um, she lays three to four eggs in her nest when, it, when she's um, laying eggs. Uh, after these eggs hatch, how many days do you guys think uh, the, the babies stay within the nest? How long does it take them to fledge? Sorry. Three weeks? Thirty days? Pretty good guesses. Uh, 16 to 18 days to fledge. So, little babies hanging out with mom for 16 to 18 days. So, mom's got to feed these guys every single day, right? And she likes to feed them these nice, soft, juicy caterpillar water. <laughs> Delicious. Within one day, so per day, how many caterpillars do you think mama has to bring her nest? I hear a lot of murmuring, so I'll just show you. Oh. 300 to 570 insect That's a lot. So, we're going to do the math that adds up to about 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars within that 16 to 18 day period. So, we can liken our native plants. So like Kroger's, or Safeways, or grocery stores, right? Mama's got to visit the grocery store a whole lot in order to feed her family. So if we don't have native plants around, Mama's going to fly a lot further back and forth a whole lot in order to feed her, her young. Do we think this is a unique situation for the Carolina chickadee? No. What percentage of terrestrial birds feed insects to their young. Ninety six. So ninety six percent of the terrestrial birds we have here in the United States have to feed insects to their young. So us putting bird feeders out only does so much. So it's important for us to also recognize within an ecosystem that you know, plants and animals have a lot of different interacting roles. Animals and insects use plants for a variety of things. You know, this conversation has been about food, but you know, animals are also using plants for their habitat. Uh, they're using it for nesting material, uh, defense. 
You know, insects and birds alike will hide within thorny bushes to not get eaten. All that good stuff. So plants also use animals. Uh, you know, plants are using animals to reproduce through pollination. You know, these insects are carrying the genetic material between different flowers, uh, causing the fertilization to occur for seed production. These plants are then relying on these insects and animals to carry those seeds elsewhere in many instances. So their populations aren't only in one spot. Um, and then plants also use animals for defense. Uh, a lot of plants will attract insects like ants to defend them. Uh, they'll reward the insects like ants with sap or a place to live. And in turn, these insects will defend the plant from other predators. So within this, it's, it's really important that we recognize that biodiversity is extremely important. You know, all of these Organisms within a system, an ecosystem, they have their own role. You know, they, they have their own role in the transfer of energy. Um, there are things called keystone species. Have you guys heard of keystone species before? A keystone species is a, a species, an organism on which the rest of the ecosystem relies or depends. Losing that species can drastically alter the ecosystem and in some cases destroy the ecosystem. So an example of a keystone species here in Indiana is the American wolf. We used to have wolves here. We hunted them all to extirpation. They're not extinct. They no longer live here in Indiana. And now what do we have? Deer. We've got deer like crazy. So, you know, at the time when we hunted these deer away, we didn't know what we were losing. We were, you know, we were just doing whatever it is humans do. Uh, but you know, the more we know and the more we learn, uh, the better we can be. So, how many species are we able to afford before we lose an entire ecosystem, or before we start losing these ecosystem services? And you know, I like to bring it back to that microprocessor within our phone. You know, we might snip one wire on accident, or drops, you know, drop our phone and one thing breaks. When that one thing breaks, you might lose the entire functioning of your screen. Or you might lose your camera, or you might lose your charger, you know. So I like to think of it that way. I also like to think of it as an airplane. You know, how many bolts can fall off your airplane before your wing falls off? So, <laughs> so one ecosystem service that is extremely important for all of us is pollination. Um, from an agricultural perspective, one in every three bites of food that we eat is uh, next to a pollinator. So a huge majority, a huge portion of the crops that we grow uh, need to be pollinated in order to, in order to produce fruit. So um, you know, depending on the crops being produced, native plants improve the populations of pollinators and thus will improve crop yields. So I don't know if you guys can see this all in the back, but there's a list of some, just some of the crops that are produced by pollinators. Almonds, apples, avocados, blueberries, cherries, grapes, melons, peppers, peaches, pumpkins, raspberries, strawberries, tomatoes, many more. So I know I like a lot of the foods on this list. I assume some of you guys do. So it's kind of really important that we maintain these pollinator services in our ecosystems. So, we're all here today. What can we do? Plant native! So, this you know, is a little abstract, but it might look familiar to you guys as adopted blockers. Let's pretend that this here is a city block. These black polygons are our houses. So, Imagine if we could start getting native plants within every household in Indianapolis. You know, we could start off, and some of you might have applied for a uh, tree planting through our community forestry program. Uh, you know, start to get trees on the block is a great first step. You know, you guys have adopted your block, so, you know, here today, you're learning about native plants, and in the fall, you guys will receive native plants that you can put in your own house. Um, you know, this picture is starting to look a little better, a little greener. Um, what's really important is that you guys are able to take this message and share it with your friends, share it with your other neighbors, share it with your family. 
Um, but more important than sharing the message, you guys can start sharing your plants. Um, as these plants develop within your own yards, you're going to start getting uh, little bunches that you can actually dig up, cut in half, and then you got a free plant. Uh, you can start sharing your seeds with your friends and family. Um, another important thing to remember is that your dollar, your dollar counts. So if you guys are buying plants from nurseries and you're only requesting native plants, what do you think these nurseries are going to start stocking? Native plants. So for us as consumers, we need to start making the demand for native plants within our nurseries. You know, these big box retail retailers, uh, you know, the big hardware stores that we visit to buy plant material, we need to start demanding that these guys start stocking native plants for us. But eventually our, our nice adoptive blocks will start looking green like this. It'll uh, we're providing nice little programs for all of our Carolina chickens. Uh, these are a few resources that I thought you guys might find helpful. Um, INPAWS, that is the Indiana Native Plant and Wildflower Society. Uh, they have a great resource for anyone who's just looking to learn more about native plants here in Indiana. What might do well in your yard, whether it's shady or sunny, wet soil, dry soil, etc. Um, Grow Indiana Natives is um, an endeavor started by Impaws. It's basically cataloging all the different nurseries within the state that sell native plants. So you guys can visit Grow Native if you know, GrowIndianaNatives.org and actually look up if there are any nurseries near you that sell native plants. And then finally, this is kind of just a little favorite of mine. Um, Indiana Wildflower Info. That or that, Indiana, or sorry, Illinois Wildflowers info. Um, if you guys ever know you have a plant and you want to learn more about it, go to this website. It will tell you about all the different faunal associations that exist with this plant. So you can learn about what insects visit your plants, what mammals, what any animal, what organisms visit your plant. You can learn about how they grow what their native range is, all that good stuff. I see you guys taking a couple of pictures, so I'll let you do that real quick. So, I'm going to start wrapping things up here. Uh, some of the points that I really want to drive on, uh, native plants are beautiful. Uh, you can create beautiful landscapes with native plants. I know sometimes they don't flower all year like an annual does, but once you start learning the cycles, you can plant stuff that flowers in the spring, and then have stuff that flowers in the summer, and stuff that flowers in the fall. Not only is that going to keep up the beauty year-round, but it's also going to be providing pollen and nectar and food sources for our native insects and wildlife. Um, I have to give my mom credit here. This picture down in the middle is a native landscape that she grew in uh, Chesterton, Indiana. Uh, just an example that native plants can be beautiful in the landscape. Um, and these are just a couple examples of beautiful blooms from sort of our heritage uh, flora. Native plants are very functional. Uh, they perform our ecosystem services very well in terms of pollution control stormwater retention, uh, erosion control, all that good stuff. Um, these are a few examples of native plants existing within green infrastructure. And native plants support our ecosystems. They are the foundation on which the rest of our ecosystems can stand. So, uh, I'd like to thank you guys.